to be at Lyon Lexington because there's been a lot of connections between Lyon Lexington and me. My dad grew up here. I heard Lyon Lexington's stories yet a uh, hundred years after he was born in our house along the Branch Creek. You know, over here, your, your water runs into the Neshaminy and then into the Delaware. Well, my, where I live, the water that runs through the meadow is the east branch of the Perkyoman. And uh, it's interesting, just south of Nakamixon and, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, hill there, the water goes into the Tohican, the deep run, and, and, and then the Neshaminy starts a little further down, and that all, it all goes east into the Delaware. But uh, uh, mine goes into the uh, Perkyoman and then into the Schuylkill, which again then joins the Delaware at uh, Philadelphia. <clears throat> I wanted to start out by giving my connections with Lyon Lexington, just a little fun stuff. Let's see if we can get a picture up here. Um, and let's see if I can point. Okay, that's where my dad grew up. It's on the New Galena Road. I don't know if you can recognize it. Let's see if I can get a pointer on here. Can somebody, some tech guy, tell me what to press to make this? Bottom button? Doesn't do a thing. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. All right. This is the house, and here's the New Galena Road. Now, the Ruths first came to Lower Salford, Henry and Magdalena Ruth, and on their farm is today the Salford Mennonite Meeting House. But after about 30 years over there, the land wasn't too good on the top there. It's, it's still sort of uh, watery and stony and so forth. After 30 years, Henry and Magdalena Ruth moved over here, and they went on this farm, not this farm, but on this farm. And uh, the reason my dad grew up on this farm was because John S. Ruth had a son, uh, a daughter, and a son named Alan Rickard Ruth. And he said, you live over here because I want my son-in-law to live over here. So that's where I used to come and play ball with Merle, my cousin Merle here. And... Uh, <clears throat> That's the farm over here. Next picture, please. That's my great, that's my grandfather, Alan Rickard Ruth. And uh, he uh, had a dairy on that, on that farm I just showed you. And I meant to bring along one of the bottles with A.R. Ruth on it, but that's at home with my outline, I think, somewhere. Okay. <laughs> Next, please. Okay, here's my dad. He, now let's go to the next picture. He looks a little mischievous, doesn't he? There. He's in the front row, and he was. Uh, my, my, his mom, when a mouse trap went off on the top of the bureau and caught her finger, she said, that, that's Henry. That was my dad. <laughs> Next, please. Okay, here, here's Pop, Henry, uh, in the front row. Now, here is his sister, Mary Ann who married Linford Ruth and got the home farm. And then she had two sons, Merle and Russ. And they were different. Russ, uh, they're gone now. Look, we all stand before the Lord. I'm not here to judge anything. But Russ, he couldn't enjoy church. World War II came along. His dad said, I can't do anything with this fellow. He told the draft board, come and get him. I can't do anything. Merle was just the opposite. He became the minister here. How many here remember Merle Ruth? All right. I just got a letter from him last week. He was sober. And they, they took what they heard in church. They took it different, which is my theme this morning. How do we take things? We all agree what's in the scripture. But how do we take it? It makes all the difference in the world. Uh, uh, Jesus said to that lawyer, he said, how readest thou? I like the King James. How do you read it? Well, he quoted it. Jesus said, you got it. But the lawyer, you know, he can argue both sides of any question. And he said, yeah, but who is my neighbor? Well, we'll talk about that in a moment. How are we going to take things? We all hear the gospel. But how do we take it? And the difference is as big as the world. People can say, I take the gospel, and they can go out and do something that this person says, I can't do that. 
It's the same gospel. All right, next picture. Uh, oh, can you go back to that one? I missed something on there. There. This man here became the uh, deacon here, Irvin Ruth. This is my dad. This is their sister, Mary Ann. And the school was right next to their farm. Go ahead. Next, please. That's the meeting house. I remember that. How many of you attended service in that meeting house? Hey, but you're in the minority. No. That was Lyme Lexington. That was a strange name. Lyme. We just said in Pennsylvania Dutch, we used to say Lexington. Drill on Lexington. Over in Lexington. Now, here's the funny thing. On the farm I live, there were connections with Lyme Lexington. First off, came two girls named Swartley Girls. And two two brothers from my house came over here to Lyme Lexington in the 1840s and got those girls. So uh, that was Lyme Lexington. And remember, before that, Henry and Magdalena Ruth moved over here from Salford. Okay, but then my dad came. In 1929, let's see if we can see him here. Go ahead. Well, that's the farm. That's the one farm they came to. I showed you now the line Lexington farm and the one on the branch where I still live in this house. Go ahead. That's my dad. Now, that's rare. He's got a plain coat on. He told me that to teach Sunday school here, he had to do that. He said, you thought you had to. So he did. He looks like the Pope or something like that. And, and he, I tell you, he could be strict. Those Ruths were something else. Uh, um, anyway, uh, that was then, this is now. But he had family devotions in our house. I didn't know anybody else that did. He would open the scripture. And one night I got a shock. He, there was a passage that he couldn't explain. He admitted it. In in the Gospels, the unjust steward, remember that story? He said, I can't. And that shocked me at first. But later I interpreted it as humility. He wasn't going off and saying, I can say everything. I can explain everything like some people do. They're, They're cocky. And that's what I'm preaching about this morning. Taking the Gospel humbly instead of making you cocky, which... Corrupts the message. Go and learn what that means. I want mercy. Back in the, in the Old Testament already. Not sacrifice. Sure, you have sacrifice, but that's not, I'm what, after what that's, what that's about. Don't miss the theme in their correctness. Don't miss the theme in here you're arguing over where something's literal or not. And not even getting the theme. Go. Get off your center. Go make a move. And then come. And then come. Follow me. That's the attitude that is precious. Now, my dad said one time, one Sunday morning, as a young guy, I think before he was a Sunday school teacher, he sat at the back, and there was a man from Tomens and came over. In those days, we used to visit each other's churches a lot. We did. We, we felt ties with the whole Franconia conference. I mean, we were way over there. We knew people at Vincent, and we knew people at Deep Run. And it was normal. It was, it was the way it was. You, you were part of a fellowship. And you know that your fellowship differed in some ways from mainline Christianity. Now, it could make you sort of proud. That was the bad effect. On the other hand, it's a little bit like the Amish. The Amish think everybody else is a little higher than they are. <laughs> They've got their problems, too. I don't want to praise them too much. Okay. By the way, anybody back again? Anybody know who this is? Who? John Ruth. Married May. John? Uh, had a <laughs> he had a son, John. And he had a son, John. And... Uh, his son, John, told me 10, 15 years ago he never liked me because they always wanted him to be like me. Well, I couldn't blame him for feeling bad about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's no way to, uh, to impress your child. Anyway, next, please. That's where my dad came and got his wife. Where is that? 
Salford. And that thing still sits in the middle of the complex today. We built all around it. That was built in 1924. Next. Here's where our parents didn't go to Salford. They went to Finland. They went to Finland. Gospel mission, Finland, Mennonite gospel mission, all welcome. In here, it was a store. It was a cigar factory. And we started a, a church in there. And by 1938, I was almost nine years old, they had revival meetings. And I'll tell you, that revival preacher, he was still coming out of the army. She still had uh, uh, hooks and eyes instead of buttons. I don't know how he can show that. That's good. <laughs> Anyhow, but he preached. And boy, he sang to us, Oh, sinner, what will you do when the stars begin to fall? Well, I was sitting right in here. I didn't know what I'd do. You know, he said, he told me, You'll cry for rocks and mountains. Whew, boy, I heard that. And then he sang, Rocks and mountains, they won't hide you. Well, I caved right there. I couldn't understand how the people behind me would sit there night after night, risk, you know, for 30 minutes, risk an eternity. I told my mom. She said, well, uh, you're under conviction. That was a... Anyway, she said, we'll have to tell Papa about this. Well, any, I won't tell that whole story. But... We had a baptism, and they baptized me. I was nine years old yet. And the bishop came. Let's take a look at him. Remember? Remember, Arthur? He always reminded me of the Apostle Paul. Then they had a big guy right beside him. His name was John Lapp. And these bishops showed up in that church. And I had my little examination. Arthur questioned me to see if I was ready for baptism. Now, mind you, I'm not, not quite nine yet, a month or two away from being nine. And he started asking me, he said, now, John, he said, how are we saved? Well, I was ready for that. I said, uh, Jesus died on the cross to save us from sin. That's right, he said. See, there you get your scripture like that lawyer. He's a lawyer. He could quote the scripture. But then uh, uh, Arthur Ruth threw me a curve. He said, how do we know that? And you know, it stumped me. I, I didn't know if I choked or what. He says, the Bible tells us. Oh, I said, yeah, I did know that. Yeah. Because yeah. for a minute there, I wanted that they would go through it, you know. But the point is, I want to talk this morning, or I'm talking about knowing something. It's there, but how do we respond? That makes all the difference. Okay? Move ahead. Oh, who's this? Rhoda and Russ. Russ Bishop came all the way across from here to, he had Ruth's background too, you know, his mom, I guess it was. And he found Rhoda on our farm. And we were here, I believe, I believe it was in, yes, it was in this building. When Greg, remember, was in an accident, their youngest son was killed. That was so tough. So our hearts were bound, the line Lexington. You know, there's hardly any deeper fellowship than grief when you get all the way to the core. It's when you're having fun. That's good fellowship, too. Let's have all we can. But grief is when you touch at the heart. I, I miss the fact that I was in a quartet with three young, three guys from Line Lexington. Ernie Hange was the big, well, his dad was, Bill Hange. And then uh, Paul Myers, the son of the preacher here. And Ted Waller. Ted Wallers. Remember Al, how many remember Al Wallers? All right. Remember Al? He was sort of, he was sort of, he had his damaged goods. Uh, one arm wasn't right. And his face wasn't right. You know what? He was a song leader here. You should have seen him clump up here. Number 101, and we all sang beautifully with him, you know. It was, none of this you had to, you know, uh, look the part. It, it was part of the fellowship, you know. The humble were included. 
That was precious to me. I learned, I learned really uh, from Lyme Lexington through my dad the humility of the gospel. He didn't think of himself as very important. He didn't think of him. He used to think his brother Irvin was bright and he wasn't. Uh, the teacher said uh, in the class at the end of the, barn, uh, end of the farm there, he said, Irvin would know. So my dad always thought he, he had that kind of humility. Now that didn't mean he didn't, he couldn't be, take a stand. He could be very stern. All right, let's keep moving. Uh, all right. I want to talk about how we take the scriptures. And what I have here is an old proctor in which it's a story of the uh, Garden of Eden. Now, here's Eve. Oops. There's Eve. There's Adam. You know what this is. The serpent stood upright. And here are all the trees of the, gar of the, of the garden. And God said to Eve, you can have anything. Have it all, except there is a limit. If you go past that limit, you're going to get hurt. You'll die. And then this fellow here, he says, now are you sure? Do you really take, you take God seriously? How do you know it's not a trick just to keep you from being smart? How do you know that? And he invited Eve to take another attitude. Same, same God talking. Yeah, really? You don't have to come by faith. Be smart. Be smart. And so she takes the fruit, doesn't she? She, t she picks it and gives it to Adam. Look at this symbol of pride. What is this? It's a peacock. All right. And all the animals uh, and so forth. Uh, now my wife, next one please. My wife copied that. And uh, here you see she made it so that you could look at it. Uh, again, the attitude, enjoy the garden, enjoy the earth, all of it in its variety. But hey, this is a dangerous. Don't go past that limit. And he says, take another attitude. That's at the bottom of it all. Don't trust God. Make, people, maybe it's all a big trick on you. That's not faith. Next, please. Okay, that's history. Um, let's see, I was going to, oh, skip, uh, just ignore that for the moment. That first story, uh, Garden of Eden, is how you take God's word. Now think of the New Testament and think of Peter. He had three years or so to walk with Jesus, to learn the way, and Jesus liked him. And he, uh, he he's a star in the Gospels, Peter is, in all of the Gospels, in one way or another. But then they come, after a while, the, if Jesus says, now, the way that I'm teaching you, the way of humility and obedience, involves a cross. Oh, Peter says, not if I'm around. I'll take care of you, don't worry. He took it wrong. He took it wrong. Just like the people that took it wrong when Jesus sat and ate with sinners. He's, uh, what? They took it wrong. Jesus said, hey, wait a minute. Go. Go and learn. Start even in the prophets. Start in the Old Testament. What do I want? I don't want correctness. I don't want absolute doctrine. I want relationship. That's the good news. Go. Get off your system of thinking. Get off your pride. And go and learn what the theme is of the story. I want mercy and not sacrifice. Well... Peter says, uh, and you know what Jesus, what did Jesus call uh, Peter when he said that? Talk like that. Get behind me what? Hey, you're talking the wrong thing. You're taking it wrong, Peter. And Peter still didn't get it. And Jesus wanted Peter and John, James and John as wrong as they were. He liked them. Who did he want in the Garden of Eden but them? With him. They fell asleep on him. But he wanted. He loved him. He loves you and me, in all our, in all our fecklessness, in all. When we miss the point, he still loves us. And uh, when they came to arrest Jesus, what does Peter do? He whips out a sword, a sword. 
And he takes a swipe. And Jesus says, Peter, put that away. Peter could have said, well, you talked about swords. You talked about having two swords. Peter, they who take the sword will perish with the sword. This is about giving life, not taking it. Did Peter get it? Well, he betrayed Jesus. Anyway, how Peter took the gospel before the resurrection and how he took it afterward. Okay, those are Old Testament and New Testament stories. Now, I was going to tell some historical stories. I can see what it was going to be here. All right. Uh, here is the city of Zurich, Switzerland. I hope to visit it in August for the last time in my life. Maybe I've been there 50 times leading tours. Uh, here's the here's the jail over here. If you got any Landis blood in you, that's where Hans Landis was kept. You couldn't even straighten your head out in there before they took him out and and chopped off his head. Uh, and over here is the main. This is the water church. Today they have this all filled in now. Uh, this is the lake and this is the river. Next, please. And. This man here, he began saying to himself, you know, we've got to read the New Testament and we've got to preach in German so that people can hear it. And so he opened it. He was the main preacher in the city of Zurich and he was still a Catholic priest. He opened his Bible and instead of saying in Latin and stuff like that and looking back, he looked toward the people and talked in their language. And he opened it to Matthew 1. And, he, and he, he was brilliant. He could read you know, Hebrew, Greek, Latin, so forth. And, uh, uh, you know, when you read, when you preach from Matthew 1 and you go a few chapters, what do you get into? The Sermon on the Mount. Whew. They had never heard it. One old man said that the hair stood up in the back of my neck. That's in the scripture? That's how we can be? Not, thou shalt not this and not that and not that, but blessed are those who get it. Blessed are the meek. They will inherit the earth. And you know, there was a young fellow in town that didn't have it together. He was brilliant. His name is Conrad Grebel. That was, that's Swingley preaching there. That's the man that Conrad Grebel admired so much. Go ahead. Well, the, here it was the town hall. And this was one of, one of the many um, guild houses. This is the Guild of the Snail. And this is right down in the heart of... Uh, I later had my chance once to... Uh, let me think. Yeah. To speak in, to the uh, Reformed Church preachers in town there. Go ahead. Next. And here is Wingley. He is holding a Bible. And back here sit the, the uh, bosses of the town, the town council... And over here are people who, here's a monk, and uh, these are the, uh, the Catholic priests. And Zwingli says, you read in the Bible, and it's different from what you fellows do. Next. Well, that's not Conrad Grable, but it's a picture right when he was living. He was brilliant. His teacher said at the University of Vienna that he's going to be the top man in the Renaissance in Switzerland. He knows he's Greek. He knows he's... Latin, and uh, Conrad fell in love with the scriptures. It changed. He was a he, he was fooling away. He went to the University of Paris, didn't attend class and stuff. He didn't have it together. After a while, he moved in with his girlfriend. He knew his parents. His mom, he said, would go wild if she knew. And but he heard this scripture, and he started pulling. He, he did what you would call a paradigm shift. A paradigm is simply pattern. Pattern of reality, pattern of anything. You shift. That's what Jesus called for to Nicodemus. You know, you have to be born from above. You have to have a new mentality. We call it, you have to have a paradigm shift. Peter didn't have it, remember? Even up to the cross. He didn't have the paradigm shift. He heard the words. That lawyer was just trying to say, yeah, but who is my neighbor? He's, that's not paradigm shift language. And Jesus didn't mince words with, with Nicodemus. 
He said, you can't even see the issues if you don't have the paradigm shift. If you're not born from above. And that paradigm shift, that changes not only the individual, it changes the society, the church, which is about relation. It changes relationships if you go through the paradigm shift. Well, uh, Conrad Grebel went through it and uh, Zwingli did not like it a bit and his parents didn't like it. Go ahead. That was a girl from right around that time. Her, he moved in with her and uh, later met, did marry her. Go ahead. Just to show you this. Now, we're not academics here this morning. But see, Conrad Grebel, Zwingli wrote a book and he, let, he said, Conrad, you put a poem at the end of that book. I'll put it. You write a poem and I'll put it. Conrad Grebel, in gratitude, this is Latin, for the restored gospel, he'd gone through the shift. And he's still showing off his learning. This is in Greek. And it's a sort of an angry poem. You know, when you're young and on the way, you boy, you're going to change things and all those fakes up front and, and running things. That's the way he felt at the time. Go ahead. But Switzerland had got, talked about the gospel, but it hadn't gone through the paradigm shift. Look at this. The tenderness of Jesus and Mary, the authority of the church. Look at this sword. It's right in the middle. That wasn't shifted. Next. What happened was, it was a time when the nobles were being attacked by the farmers, the peasants. See them doing that there? The nobles live in here with fine clothes, Jesus said, with fine raiment. And they said, enough of this. This Christianity has nothing for us, us poor people that do all the work, and you have all the fun. And so they attacked. And that's right when our Mennonite church was born. Now hang on for a moment. Next. That's a picture of the peasants. They didn't have big weapons. They had their farm equipment. The Bauern Aufruhr, the peasants' uproar, uh, 1524, 25. Just when Conrad Grebel was thinking through, he said one time he wrote home a letter from Paris. He said, I'm not, this isn't right. I'm living high on the hog here. And uh, the pe I'm on tax money. The, the rich people want friends in Switzerland. That's why they give me this scholarship. So he had that peasant, he had that, but the, he had to come, he wasn't fully through the paradigm shift yet. Go ahead. He heard about this man, this preacher, his name is Thomas Mincer, and Thomas Mincer said, you have to go through the paradigm shift. And Conrad Grebel heard about this, he wrote him a fan letter in October 1524. He wasn't, he wasn't baptized yet, Conrad wasn't. But he had gone through the paradigm shift. And, he, and before the letter was written, before, he put a PS on it at the end because after it was written, but it was raining so the mail didn't go, then he heard that Thomas Munster said, we have to overthrow the government like Peter. We have to use the sword. Too bad, but we have to. Whoops. Conrad Grebel put a PS on the letter. Go ahead. That's Conrad Grebel's wax seal. They put it on letter. Can you see C.G. Grebel, Conrad Grebel. This is a lion with claws. And in that letter, he said something very interesting. Next. He said, I'm sorry if you think that we're going to bring in the kingdom by overthrowing the government with the sword. You got it wrong. He said, Christians, Christians are like sheep in the middle of, uh, under wolves. He said, they have to go through trouble and cross like our Lord did. And he said, they don't use either worldly sword or war because with them, killing is totally put away. Go up to do. No more killing. He had gone through a paradigm shift. Swingley hadn't. Next. They had big discussions. First in the town hall. Go ahead. And then one January evening, Saturday evening, under one of these roofs, I don't know which one, go ahead, this fellow here with a blue coat 
Georg Blaurock, ask Conrad, Conrad, for God's sake, give me true Christian baptism. Now they all have, were all, everybody was baptized. You had to be. If you didn't get baptized, you were in deep trouble. And so Conrad baptized him in this little circle. They had no hierarchy. They had no order or anything. They were just trying to obey the scriptures. They took it different. Go ahead. Swingley so said, that's it, you fellas. He took one of them, Conrad's buddy, Felix Mons, and they pulled him off of this fishing thing, drowned him. That'll take care of you. You're not going to do that. You're not going to baptize people. Swingley so hadn't gone through the paradigm shift. He saw the scriptures and turned on Conrad and Felix Mons. Go ahead. Gerard Blaurock, they stripped him, and they... they uh, Beat him almost to death. Go ahead. Down this long street the whole way. And uh, they told him never to come back again. He had to promise before they would let him go. Go ahead. And here they caught him and put him. This is in northern Italy. They caught him there. And there he was not just killed, uh, beheaded. He was burned to death. Because the Catholics were even stronger than the Protestants. He was burned to death in that little town. Go ahead. There was another monk named Michael Sattler. He came out of the monastery, got married, and he said, we've got to write things down. And he wrote down seven brotherly agreement of some children of God about seven different topics. A little tiny book. Go ahead. Look at it there. I'm seeing it in a little museum. That's the so-called Schleitheim, Con Schleitheim Confession. Schleitheim. It's a little village that you can visit today yet. So that's why you and I are sitting here in a way. It's how you take the scriptures. It's fine to, to see them again, but how do you apply them? That's my message this morning. Keep going. The man that wrote that little book, Michael Sattler, he was burned to death here. And I want to tell you something that happened there. They, had, they examined him. And one of the accusers, it was about the Muslims, believe it or not, 1527, like we have today. The Muslims were on the war path against the Christians. And they, the authorities said to Michael Sattler before they killed him, they said, you said you would rather fight with the Muslims than against them. He said, what I meant was this. Christians know they're not the, the Muslims are Turk. They don't know that. They don't have that in their gospel. It would make more sense for me to fight with them because they don't even understand. Christians understand. And they still do it. No, they, they tore out Michael Sattler's tongue and burned him to death. Okay? Next. That's Martin Luther today. See how he holds the Bible? And he looks so strong, but he's standing behind a fellow with a sword. Next, same thing at Worms, near Worms, at the statue for Martin Luther. Now, how about Zwingli? Go ahead. Well, that's Conrad's brother-in-law. But look, he's a, he's a scholar, but he has a sword up in here. Next, that's Zwingli. And the Reformed people don't like that statue. They say, why do you have that sword there? Well, because, next picture, he had a double grip. And you know, Zwingli pushed until his reformed people went and fought against the Catholics. And he himself was cut to pieces in that battle. Those who take the sword will perish with the sword. Okay, let that there for a moment. Let that picture there for a moment. Now, I was going to tell some, some very quick stories. That's how Jesus taught. Without a parable, spake he not unto them. It's a necessary method. Parable, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. They tell us that old Bishop Jonas, or um, Josiah Clemmer from Franconia, he died in 1906. But somebody asked him one time, as an ordination was coming up, they said, well, who should we nominate for the lot? 
what, what, what do we look for in, a, in those days? You know, it was a man always. What do we look for? And old Josiah said, can he tell a story? Because that's how you teach. If it's just plain uh, an outline of an idea, a structure, you can argue, you can debate, particularly if you're a lawyer, and you don't have to get it. You can get lost, but a story, and Jesus told that lawyer a story about relationship. Remember I made the point that when Michael Sattler wrote those seven points that we can agree on, it was not about doctrine. It was not about incarnation. It was not about inspiration. It was about relationship. That's what church is. Remember Matthew 18? Jesus said, when you have an issue and people won't agree, tell it to the circle. There was no church then yet. Ecclesia. Share it with the group. And then make a call. And you've got heaven's authority to do that. Which is not the other way around. Make sure, he said, make a call. Just like an umpire in a baseball game. He has to make a call. And he, he, Jesus didn't say, and you will always get it right. Note that. I've seen the church make wrong calls. I've seen the church hurt people in my life. I've seen the church wait too long on certain points, certain points and give in too easily. Jesus wasn't talking about that. He was talking about how we do it. It's share it with the group. If the individual won't listen, share it with the group. And then make a call. And he says, and what you make that call is backed. Your authority to do that is backed in heaven. Now, can you hear that? He didn't say you'll always get it right. He said you make a call. You forbid some things. But you allow some things. You used to do nothing but forbid. Now it seems we're doing not much more than allowing. We're afraid of that verse, aren't we, anymore? Afraid we'll hurt people, perhaps. But that's what Jesus said. What if a person in a ball game would say, now, I'm sorry, I have feelings. I don't want to accept just three strikes. That hurts my feelings. I want four or five. Thank you very much. Well, fine. But that's batty up. That's not baseball. That's just fooling around. If the church doesn't require anything, is it church? And if the church doesn't allow anything, is it church? It risks making some calls. God gave us a brain. Not just to turn off, but to use. Do the best you you can know how. You know when we have four or five Gospels, if if you... Consider Acts a story, which it is. When I was little, they used to have little books out called uh, um, Harmonies of the Gospel. One time we had a preacher at Finland. My parents put me in the room with him to, for him to straighten me out, I guess. And I brought these contradictions up. Here in one gospel, it's, it's in one chronology, and here it's another. And he explained it away and left me feeling sort of funny. I, I thought I'm, 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 I'm going to agree because I'm young and you're old, but later in life it's clear to me God did not take Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and turn off their, their artistic and their creative work. He said, you write it and they'll get the theme. To me, that's almost more of a uh, guarantee of truth than if God would have said you're just a hand you're just an automaton you're just a robot I'll put it in there and then you let your hand do it no he let us like he let Peter make the mistakes and even in the gospels if we're going to insist on the literal absolute uh, uh, correctness of everything we're going to miss the theme well like like uh, some they had to uh, learn it over and over from Jesus. Now, maybe one story I'll tell here quickly. We had two grandsons of Salford Mennonite Church. 
they met in Nicaragua. The one was trying to help the mosquito Christians in their relationship with the government because he had learned, he had listened to Matthew 5. Blessed are the peacemakers. His name is John Paul Edra. Here, the Contras, who were fueled by American tax money, were trying to assassinate John Paul Edra. And who was their chaplain? The other grandson of Salford. His father had said, when somebody wrote to him and said about, uh, you know, some of the things you're doing, uh, is that really, you began with the Mennonites, but now some of the things you're doing don't look too good. And that person, the, the guy's dad wrote back, we have the letter in our archives. He said, no, you don't have any business checking with me. I don't belong to you, and you don't belong to me. We both belong to God. And so he got away from the, discerning with the group. And here are two Salford grandsons. They both came from the same scripture. One's trying to make peace, and the other one is encouraging, encouraging Colonel North's troops to assassinate him. Now, two ways of taking the same scripture. Is there a paradigm shift going on here or not? Jesus said that's the only way it works. Uh, all right. That's a story. Uh, <clears throat> I'll tell you a line Lexington story back from the revolutionary days. You know that uh, our people did not take an oath. I don't know if you knew that William Penn said that's a recommendation. He said, give these people special treatment because they're various kinds of Mennonites and they won't fight and they won't swear. William Penn wouldn't either. And that came on the boat that my ancestors came from. That from our farm. I read it in his pen's writings. Okay. Now, but you have to give your promise of faithfulness to the king, like everybody else. Sure, we can give our word. We won't put our hand on the Bible and say, now we're telling the truth. No, we're not going to. Jesus said, swear not at all. Love your enemies and all that. Penn said, good. Let's have more of you kind of people. That's literally what he said. Well, then comes a time when uh, we're not happy with the king over here in, England, in America. And a group rises up in Philadelphia called the Continental Congress. And it sends out a message. Everybody now has to swear off loyalty to the king, George II or whatever it was. Okay. But then there was a problem. People did who had sworn on now swore off. But the Mennonites said, we never swore on. But we gave our word, and we have to keep our word. The king is no problem to us. We never had it so good in Europe. Well, we can't, we can't take our word back. Well, there was a, a, a bishop at Franconia named Christian Funk. He said, look, it's all a worldly business. Just go ahead and sign it. Sign the, sign the test oath. We know it doesn't mean anything anyway. No, they said, no, that's not what we're going to do. Bishop Andrew Ziegler and the other and from, from Swamp and from Deep Run. No. Yes, we're going to do it, he said. And about 50 families followed him. Now, here's the point that I want to make. After the war was all over. And uh, so the main body said, okay, we're, we'll, we'll go along with the new government. Now, let's come together again in the Franconia Conference. There was no two conferences then. And so uh, they talked to Christian Funk. And they said, let's, let's say that was a tough time. Let's, uh, and we know this from Christian Funk's own writing. That's how we got this story. And it came down to the point where they said, if you will simply show by the received hand that you went away from the conference's gospel uh, uh, order, and we won't debate anything anymore. We'll just, the people you baptized and all that will we'll say it's, we're together again. Just give us your hand in recognition that the church had the authority. Oh no, he said, I won't do that. Why not? Well, that would say I was wrong. I'm not going to do that. So Bishop David Ruth from Lyon Lexington according to Funk said, 
Give me your hand. Just do it, he said. It'll give such pleasure. No way. Stayed split. Stayed split until the 20th century. I, could, I, I can't go into history. Why? Why couldn't he do that? Two attitudes. Two attitudes. But what? You know, when we're so right and we're so correct, then everybody else is wrong. And then you hear harsh words. You don't hear the words of Jesus, who says, I'm meek. I'm meek, he said. Follow me. Go and learn what it means. I don't want correctness. I want mercy. I want relationship. Structure. Ideas, ideas are structures, texts are structures. You can argue about them. The Swiss Anabaptists told the Northern Mennonists, you always want to talk about uh, incarnation, whether Jesus had any, uh, a navel, whether he had anything fleshly in him at all. We don't know about that. Just, let's, just let that go with all, uh, uh, all uh, moderateness, and let's just try to follow Jesus. That's what they said. We had a preacher at, at Salford who said, when tough things came up, he was very quotable. He would talk Dutch, of course. He, he was a carpenter. He, he, was, he was wise. He said, when, when you're nailing the floorboards, everybody can help. Then when you come to the corners, you find out who are the carpenters. That was the kind of fellow he was. Hen Clemmer, his name was. And... Uh, they came up to certain tough things that they were going to argue about. And he said in Dutch, We're going to admit that's over our heads. We're going to let that in the Bible. We're going to be respectful. Humility. He's remembered to this day. Hen Clemmer. That's Jesus' invitation to us. <clears throat> Remember when the lawyer, with his brilliance, his and Jesus challenges him. He says, well, what do you read? How readest thou? He passed that test. But when it came to attitude, he could argue. And I do not like to hear harshness from our people. When the world goes into, uh, into um, polarization over politics, I don't like to hear harsh voices from us. That's not what Jesus taught us. And it's not how we were born as a church. We have a different take. How readest thou? Go and learn about mercy. What is mercy? Mercy is relationship. Doctrine, you can argue each other into a corner, particularly if you're bright, if you have a lot of... Arguing is not the point. Go and learn what that means. Who's my neighbor? I'll tell you a story. Well, I'll bring this to a close. How am I going to do it? Okay, next. Well, I'll take you over to Burnfield. My wife went into frock tour. I never married her for anything like that. I, I thought she was the belle of the ball, and I got this. Uh, and great cooking, by the way. All right, next picture. A picture that she did. All right, I have a story behind this picture. It's a picture of Revelation 5. Remember when the four and twenty elders are there? Harping on their harps. And uh, uh, let's see what else is on here that we can see. Uh, one sat on the throne. Roma didn't give him any form. Here's a lamb. And here is the song. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive honor and glory and strength and riches and power and blessing. And uh, then she put our local proctor in the margin bringing together our folk tradition with this great passage in the scripture. And she, by the way, imitated a, a painting from the 1500s on that. Well, I want to tell you something. That, she also did another big picture in our living room, and it's in German. This is in English. People will walk in there. They all admire it. I, I'm lucky. I live in a house full of fracture. It's beautiful. What can I say? I didn't earn it or anything like that. It just came. Beauty, design, meaning. Uh, for 30 years now, it's in there. And uh, one day, 
this was hanging in our dining room. And we had guests. Nobody ever asked much questions about this, but I saw this guest sitting down. I saw his eyes narrowing. Something was happening in his head. What's that picture? What's it about? Guess who that was? It was Roy Hange. For 30 years, people would come. You know what their question would be? How long does it take you to make that? Surface. I was happy. It was, uh, I could brag about my wife and all that. But he's looking at it. He's getting it. You know what it is? It's about a paradigm shift. Let me explain. Here's, you remember Revelation 5, when the writer John says, uh, I wept. Why did he weep? Anybody remember? I wept much. Why? Because the meaning of life was in a book. You opened the book, you understood what it was about. You got the point of life. But nobody could open it. The philosophers, the historians, the artists, they couldn't open it. They couldn't tell you what the meaning of life was. And the voice comes to John. Don't weep. Somebody can open it. The line of the tribe of Judah, the lion. And I looked and beheld a what? A lamb. Paradigm shift. Jesus said to us, he said, go. Get off your what you sat on. Get off what you comes first in your head. Get off what people say. You have heard it said. Go and learn what it means. And what it means is, I want justice. I want mercy. And that's why I sent my son into the world. And we hear his voice this morning, don't we? We hear Jesus talking. He says, go. And then he says, come. Follow me. He says, because I'm meek. I'm lowly in heart. And you'll find rest to your soul. Take my yoke. It is a yoke. But it'll fit. And you can put your heft under it and you can work. You can do it. Take that. Take that, what I tried to explain to Nicodemus. And what it took Peter so long to learn. That's why I asked Peter. He said, Peter, do you love me? Because that's what it's about. Yeah, sure. Peter, do you love me? Sure, of course I love you. Do my work. Peter, do you love me? Now my feelings are getting hurt. You know I love you. Pass it on. 